Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure being here talking to you today. Uh, so the work that I'm going to present you is on developing digital twins for operational monitoring as well as post earthquake assessment of civil infrastructure. So the idea is applicable to civil infrastructure in general. We are in this presentation very focused on uh, on bridges, and uh, I'm going to show you the the framework, the general idea. Uh, and some applications uh, using uh, numerically simulated and also real-world uh, data. So this is the work that is being done in collaboration with ET's uh, research group. Uh, so uh, let me get started by uh, telling you why we should bother about this subject. So the problem is that we have an inventory of aging infrastructures, uh, we have limited money to fix them, and at the same time, especially in West Coast, our infrastructure are exposed to earthquake hazards. Uh, so when it comes to asset management, probably stakeholders would like to have to know the remaining life in their assets uh, in order to make informed decision and also maximize the, the utilization of the resources that they have. When it comes to post-earthquake assessment, uh, uh, the uh, stakeholders would like to know quickly and accurately after an earthquake that what has happened in their inventory and the inventory is usually ge geographically very distributed. So despite this co complex really problem, probably the uh, most uh, reliable technology that exists today is human eye. So visual inspection has been used for uh, um, operational maintenance and also for post-earthquake assessment. Uh, the, the, the process of visual inspection for operational maintenance is, is really a costly process, requires a traffic interruption, it's inherently a subjective process and uh, when it's come to transferring the observation data to really a structural level and system level performance, uh, really there is a big disconnect. The same situation exists about post earthquake assessment. Uh, uh, more than that, we have to add the, the element of pressure and time and also the chaotic situation after an event uh, to, to the game. You know, the inspector has a family that might be affected by the earthquake, so might not be available quickly to do his job. And, and these are the facts. Uh, so there are rooms for technology contribution, and technology has been used in this field. Uh, so different type of methods has been developed and implemented. So one of them is point monitoring. Uh, it's installing a lot of sensors at different locations of the bridge, monitoring different response components. The problem with these methods is that really what they provide is, is a lot of data, not what we call information, an actionable information. It takes a lot of time to make sense of this data and, and get information out of this data. Uh, probably structural health monitoring, model-based system and damage identification is the most popular method that is being used in the literature for structural health monitoring, but these methods are known to be uh, have little or no sensitivity to localized damages in the bridges, for example, especially the damages that are important in operational conditions such as loss of pre stress force and so on. Uh, last but not the least, ND methods are a very popular method, uh, among popular methods that are being used in the industry. Condition maps such as what you see here is, is being used by local DOTs significantly, but these are very localized uh, characterization of damage and also they are only useful for operational condition post earthquake really they are they don't provide uh, so much structural and system level insight and they are very costly and time consuming to perform uh, so there is room uh, for new technology development and new idea development in this field okay uh, so we as engineer we use a mechanics based model linear nonlinear model for the purpose of forward simulation to predict uh, the response of the structure for uh, analysis, assessment, design, but we seldom use a uh, mechanics-based model for damage identification or structural halt monitoring. And probably the main reason is that our models, our forward models include large uncertainties, including material uncertainties. Often we cannot measure the inputs. For example, if we have a bridge structure with significant soil structure interaction effect, we cannot actually measure the real inputs very accurately. So the idea is as follows. If we collect some measurements out of these structures and we train our mechanics-based model through a model updating or model training process, we can estimate the model parameters. Not only that, we can estimate the inputs, the input forces on this model. Then we're going to come up end up with what we call a model that is a close representation of reality. 
<laughs> then we can go through this model. We can go through the sections, to the fibers, to the integration point levels, and we can basically investigate the different mechanisms of damage, like material nonlinear to stress to strain, and so on. So it, it's provide it, it's really a powerful tool that may provide a lot of useful information. So let me explain it uh, further here. So we have a real world structure, can be a brick. We develop a mechanics-based model of this real world structure, and then we collect data out of the real world structure. Now the data can be traffic data, earthquake data, I will talk about these two topics more. And then we train continuously and iteratively train our model with this data to reduce the uncertainties in the parameters, to reduce the uncertainties in the inputs that we have. The outcome is what we call a digital twin. It's a digital replicate of the real world asset that will be evolved through the lifetime of the real world asset with the real structure. As this data is being continuously collected, the, the model is being continuously updated and it will reflect the state of the art of the structure. So here in this presentation, I would like to show you how we can develop and maintain digital twins with traffic data as well as earthquake data for bridge structures. Uh, so I have talked about model updating. Uh, the process that we are pursuing and using is a Bayesian model updating process. And uh, the idea behind it is very simple. Uh, the uncertainties in the parameters, including input or model parameters, are characterized by probability distribution functions. We propagate these probability distribution functions into our model. We compare the resulting stochastic res uh, responses of the model with the measurements. And through this process, we, through a Bayesian updating process, or Bayesian inference process, we can update the probability distribution of our prior model parameters. So it's a process of extracting information from the data. The process is inherently uh, iterative. And as the data will come in, new data comes in, this, this process, this iterative process will be continued. OK, uh, so this is basically the idea framework for developing digital twin using traffic data. So basically, we collect uh, uh, response, tra uh, basically vibrational response of a bridge under traffic condition with regular sensors, accelerometers. On the other hand, we with, with traffic cameras or, or regular cameras, we look at the traffic on the bridge. And with some deep learning algorithms, we can detect the cars that are on the bridge and track them through the bridge. So we can know exactly the location of the cars on the bridge. We, we fit this information into our fine tuner model updating in which we have a model that the material parameter, the model parameters are unknown. The location of loads at each time is known with some uncertainties, of course, but the loads are unknown. So basically the vehicle loads are unknown. So these are the information that we can collect uh, kind of rapid. Through the model updating process, we jointly estimate the model parameters as well as the vehicle loads. So it's a joint model and vehicle load estimation or load estimation. Uh, once we do that, then uh, first of all, we have sh we can share a lot of uh, useful actionable information with the stakeholders that I will show, but also we, we will maintain a digital twin of this bridge that will be ready for the next step of the data as we'll be calling for the next earthquake as it will call, come in and so on. So, so let me show you uh, with a little more example. So here uh, we look at uh, box girder bridges as a case study and these are the typical bridges that are very common in, in, in West Coast, especially in California. By talking to experts, uh, to industry experts, we identify different damage mechanism that may happen in these bridges during operational condition. These include the deterioration in the deck, deterioration in the girders, and also the loss of pre-stress forces. So these are the common things that happens to these bridges in normal operation conditions. So basically what we want to do, we want to not only estimate the, this deterioration, but we want to localize it along the length of the bridge, basically. Tell exactly where is it located and what is the extent of, extent of location. Uh, damage. So uh, for this, unfortunately, we are in the earliest stage of this project. We don't have yet real world data to show you. So I'm going to show you uh, some examples with uh, numerically simulated data. Uh, so we basically develop a detailed model of our bridge, uh, of our box girder bridge. We divide it into different regions across the length. And then we introduce manually some damage in some of the location of this bridge. We use a realistic traffic scenario 
to simulate the response of this thing and you use this simulated response as measurement data, okay? So we said that, okay, we have this measurement data, we assume that we measure it from the real world, then we went into estimation phase, we pretend that we don't know anything about what has happened to this bridge, so we started with the nominal bridge model, and our intention was to estimate the properties of concrete at the top slab, at the gear there, at the bottom slab, the pre-stress force in the tendons, uh, across the five regions of the of the bridge so we had 20 material param 20 parameters to estimate and this uh, in addition we had Rayleigh parameters and vehicle loads and these are unknowns that we have in our model to estimate so the process is shown through this video which I will play it momentarily let me explain this from different part here as I will uh, play the video here you will see the bridge that the vehicles are moving so it's a realistic scenario the responses will be shown here the measured responses that we uh, collected from our model uh, and the the predicted responses from the updated model will be overlaid on these responses in red here you will see we had 20 model, model parameters you will see the time history uh, the evolution of this estimation process for this model, 20 model parameters and the vehicle loads will shown here the model parameters are uh, normalized by the true values so if we converge to one so we start with some values that are far from one and if we converge to one means that our process was able to recover the data from the measurement so let me now try to play this thing See, it's playing it's not playing okay perfect so say you see some traffic scenario simulated, we, collect, we, we are iteratively collecting uh, data and, and trying to update it. So you see batches of data. So the updating process is done in the windows or in the batches. Across each window we collect the data. Let me uh, repeat, repeat it again. Oops. This is very... Okay, let me play it again. So, you see we are collecting data across different batches. We are updating the parameters across that batches and updating the vehicle loads. As we collect more data, our parameters are more and more converged into the true values or one, and our vehicle loads are all converged to one. So basically, we were able, through this verification study, to estimate the parameters that we had in mind and also the vehicle loads. So, it's a, it's a kind of a... Uh, proof of concept. Now, what are the useful information, the actionable information that we can provide for the stakeholders, okay? So, basically, these are the data that we extracted from our estimation process. Initial values that was based on the nominal or, or drawings and the final estimated values. And remember that we have a damage in, a, in one of the regions of this bridge, in region 2, basically, and you can clearly observe that in a, we were able to estimate the damage in different components in region 2 basically so these are the type of actionable information that can be used by stakeholders to decide about what's going to happen in this bridge or what they're going to do with this bridge so uh, this is with traffic data now we develop a digital train that is trained with traffic data these are low amplitude data now we want an earthquake happens and we want to use this digital train to further get updates from the earthquake data and also we want to use it for post earthquake assessment the process is much simpler here we just for earthquake data we just collect the dynamic response of the bridge during the earthquake and then through a model updating process we want to estimate jointly the model parameters of the bridge and also the foundation input motions so we have a soil structure interaction effect usually in this bridge so uh, basically we have to estimate the foundation input uh, motion so uh, in order to do that we need to do uh, uh, our model the model that has been used for traffic is not useful for seismic because we have to add more components into it so these four components are mainly because of the soil structure interaction effect that needs to be modeled so as you can see the basic model is now equipped with a lot of auxiliary parts uh, that are uh, that conform conforming our seismic model now uh, for this specific bridge that we were using we were very fortunate that we had actual recording of, of real world data earthquakes with it which went to the C Smith database and we actually have five earthquakes recorded during this so I'm gonna pick one of these earthquakes and show you how the process works 
We're going to use the Santa Cruz 2018 earthquake <coughs> for, for this purpose, okay? So you can see here, before going to the jumping into the model updating, you say, see here that this is a very complex model with a lot of parameters, and some of them are very empirical, like the soil spring parameters and so on. Uh, so we have to decide about what parameters we can estimate or we have to include in our estimation process. And this can be done through a tool that is called identifiability analysis. So here, for example, you see that we have a group of 36 parameters, which is quite a lot. Uh, not all of them are identifiable. So we can basically look at the amount of information that each parameter hypothetically can receive from the data, and also the, the, um, the amount of correlation or competing effects or dependence, or statistical dependence between different parameters. And based on that, we can choose the most identifiable, basically, parameter sets, which were from it set of 36, we end up with a set of 16 parameters that are going to be identified. So this is also a video that's showing the model updating process with the real world recordings that are collected from the actual bridge during the Santa Cruz earthquake. The, in the top part, you will see uh, the bridge and the measurement channels. So see, you, we have a very limited measurement channel, it's basically six useful measurement channel for model updating of this bridge. So this is it's really sparse. Uh, here you will see the measurement data and the estimated data will be overlaid on them with the blue lines as I will explain them. Here you will see the displacement time, the, the time history of the estimated uh, foundation input motion in longitudinal and, and transverse direction. And we had 16 parameters. I couldn't plot all the 16 parameters here. I just plot five of them you know, just to represent you how this thing works in this video, but all of the 16 parameters are, are there and are being updated. So let me try to play this video. So again, we are updating in window batches, okay? You see some window batches of data that the data are incrementally being updated. So we collect batches of data in window, and we, we basically estimate a foundation input motion and also the model parameters. So the dots show the estimated value of model parameters relative to their initial value. And you can see at each estimation window, we are iterating. Basically, uh, something is changing. Let me play it again. So here, for example, you can see that our parameters are being estimated and being changed. At the same time, our foundation input motion is being estimated. And as we go, these are real world data, okay? so. Uh, as we go, you can, uh, we can appreciate really the amount of correlation that we have among the updated model responses and, and real-world measurements. Considering a lot of uncertainty, including the acceleration, uh, the low quality of the sensors and so on that, that was existing. Okay, how we can now use this thing for, for damage identification to help the stakeholders? Now we can go through our updated, our fi our updated financial model and get tons of really useful information. So for example, here we are looking at the stress strain response of one of the extreme fibers in the pier of the concrete. And stress strain response, of course, this level of earthquake was very small, so you don't see a lot of nonlinearity, but, but the same concept can be applied to larger earthquakes, so you will see a lot of nonlinearity here. So we can basically localize damage in the material level. Uh, here we are looking at, for example, a shear key force deformation in the top of abutment and also the passive soil for force deformation. These are the type of information that really um, is very hard or impossible to measure with uh, sensors. With this, I will conclude my presentation. I have to acknowledge the funding resources that we have, especially the USDOT SPR program, uh, and also my colleagues at uh, SC Solutions. Thank you so much for your attention.